Welcome to the Potentia Full Year Outlook. Uh, today we have a speaker that has come in to give us some timely information about the markets that we are dealing with today. And to introduce him, we have Todd Barney. Todd is the Senior Consultant for Invesco. And Todd, would you introduce Tally? Kevin, thank you so much and thank you all for attending. I'm extremely excited to introduce Tally Leger, our Senior Investment Strategist with Invesco. He's going to bring some timely and most importantly, non-consensus information. Tally? Welcome and thanks for joining. We're excited to be delivering this timely and topical presentation entitled, Seven Reasons to Favor Stocks in Fed Tightening cycles. Now I say timely and topical because technically the Federal Reserve, our central bank, has not begun yet to raise interest rates, but we do think it's coming and we're trying to prepare you, clients and investors, for this new monetary policy regime, including higher interest rates. So let's flip forward in the slides here. These are the seven big questions and answers that we want to be providing to you in the next 30 minutes and the course of our conversation. Starting with number one, as you can see in the agenda, how's the Fed responding to inflation and a tight labor market? So first of all, let me explain the chart before we provide the answer to give you kind of a stable concept here. So what we're showing, this is the dark blue line in the chart, U.S. financial conditions alongside manufacturing activity here at home. That is the light blue line. So left side, right side. Now, the first question that you might have is, well, what are financial conditions? The financial conditions index includes things like stock prices. We've seen some volatility there to start the year. It also includes bond yields. So bond yields have been rising. Bond prices have been coming down along with stock prices. Corporate bond spreads above their treasury counterparts have been widening out. And the US dollar, our currency, has been stable to strong in this volatile environment. You put it all together, those are the components of the FCI, I call it for short, okay? Now, if, again, if you're wondering why we talk and obsess about financial conditions, this is the visual answer or representation. As you can see, these two lines are very closely related. They're almost on top of each other. So I gave you the definition of the financial conditions index. But if we take a step back, financial conditions are the transmission mechanism for monetary policy, okay? The Fed, our central bank, essentially manipulates conditions to engineer desired economic outcomes. So that's where we are in this chart. So if you look in the far right-hand side, those two lines have been coming down. So the Fed means business. One of the key messages in this presentation is don't fight the Fed. They are actively trying to cool down an overheating U.S. economy. And they're doing it through these financial conditions. So slowly starting to remove those supportive financial conditions. They're becoming less and less easy or supportive of growth. So if you look on the far right hand side, it's no coincidence. It's actually been coinciding with a, a more moderate pace of economic output in the country. So this is the Fed doing its job to kind of tap the brakes after putting the foot down on the accelerator for so long. Okay, So that's where we are in the Federal Reserve's reaction function and the outlook for monetary policy, preparing us and markets for interest rate hikes. Okay, now this is probably the most important question that we all want an answer to in this entire presentation. And I wanna get straight to it. And this is one personally that really helped calm me down. And this is how did US stocks perform in past Fed 
tightening cycle. So to give you the comparison, on the left, I show you how markets did, US stocks in particular, in easing cycles compared with on the right, because that's, I think, where we're heading, these Fed tightening cycles, okay? So on the right, the dark blue line is the federal funds rate. That's the policy rate the central bank controls directly, okay? Now it goes back, as you can see, to the early 1980s. This is important. This gives us some current context because that is the last time we saw inflation as hot as it is right now. So that's what we mean by an overheating economy. The Fed's trying to cool down this overheating economy. But the point is, if you look at those vertical gray bars back to the early 1980s, those represent the past six Fed tightening cycles, okay? So we've got some good cycles, some good history to look back to. And the point is, this is very encouraging, from the first to the last interest rate hike from the Fed, the stock market here at home went up every single time. Okay, so if past is prologue, we have a similar expectation. And I'm not talking about the first hike. I don't care about the first hike. I care about the last hike, right? So I think the market right here is, is primed and prepared for at least one, probably two. If they get it done in one, one hit, that means a 50 basis point increase. I think the market with, can withstand that. The second observation I want to make is, yes, the success rate is 100%, but notice in the call-out box, the average return is just in the mid-single digits. So the message there is, I think, in this part of the market cycle, we have to kind of curb our enthusiasm and lower our expectations for returns. All that means is I think stocks can do well in 2022, just probably not as well as they did in 21 and 2020 before it. So kind of restraining our enthusiasm here. Stocks can do well. So we just talked about domestic equities. That takes us to further thoughts of field. What about global equities? Okay. It's a similar story. Now, again, same setup. I wanted to give you the comparison of how these different global equity categories did in easing cycles on the left versus tightening cycles on the right. Now, I framed the right chart because I think that's the regime that we're about to enter. So some of you might be surprised. I know I was to see EM and international stocks uh, up near the top of the leaderboard. But I also, I want to emphasize this, that U.S. large cap growth stocks were also among the leaders. Now I hit that quickly now because we're going to come back to that and reinforce that message. It's very important. Now some of you might be wondering, well, why is that? Why did stocks generally do better in tightening cycles? And I know there's been a lot of angst to start the year, the drawdowns and volatility in stock markets globally. And why do they do so much worse in easing cycles? Isn't it the opposite? This is some simple logic that I think will resonate with you and make a lot of sense. And it has to do with the fact that four out of the past six easing cycles overlapped with economic recessions. And as we know from recent experience, that's also typically the time when the stock markets are not doing well. Stock markets are falling, okay? When the Federal Reserve is raising rates, more often than not, those regimes occur in the second half of business cycles. And that feels about right. We think if our back of the envelope math is correct, we're about the middle of the current cycle. So we're entering act two, okay? But keep that in your back pocket. We're going to come back to U.S. large cap growth stocks in this environment. Now that gets us to the fourth question. What was the consistency of those returns? Averages can be deceiving, as we all know. So this helps us to kind of dig a little deeper. And now I'm taking a shot a little bit at the EM, that's emerging markets, and international categories that I just flashed you in the earlier 
slide. So when you look at the batting averages, unfortunately, with the exception, I'm going to come back to this, of U.S. large cap growth, none of these single categories on their own ranked at the top of the leaderboard more than 50% of the time. And if you're betting people, we don't like those odds. That's no better than a coin toss, okay? How do we do a little bit better? So in the next slide, this is question number five. In the current environment, this Fed tightening cycle, how should we be positioning ourselves? That gets me to this more granular slide. So when you combine U.S. large cap and growth in the single category, it's the only one that was at the top of the leaderboard consistently actually outperformed almost 70% of the time. That makes a lot of sense to me in this environment. And I'm gonna give you some more kind of texture and color around that statement. But for now, just keep in mind, we like the odds of those historical returns. Feels right in this environment. So the bottom line is, I think that US large cap growth can resurface given tighter fiscal and monetary policy coupled with a slower pace of activity here at home. So what about sectors? So again, we're, we're digging deeper, trying to provide a little bit more detail and granularity. So the chart on the left, the dark blue line, I'm bringing back the federal funds rate again, okay? Alongside the blue line, which is the cyclical relative to the defensive sectors of the U.S. stock market. So this answers the question, how should we be positioning from a sector perspective? So the good news is, if you look on the right side of that left chart, we're in the northern hemisphere still. So the light blue line is showing us that cyclicals are still outperforming the counter cyclicals or the true defensive sectors of the market, just not as much as they were in 2020 and 21, all right? So we're, again, we're lowering our return expectations, okay? And for some of you who are wondering, what's with that difference between the policy rate, the dark blue line, and the sector returns, the light blue line? That is simply the market telling us that the Federal Reserve is behind the curve. They need to raise rates, and that's, again, why we think it's gonna happen. The market has already voted, and it's preparing us for these eventual rate hikes. And so that's the history that goes back to the mid 1980s, same time horizon. On the right, all I've done to give you some more information there is I've extracted the actual returns and you can see the averages on the far right hand side. So again, we wanna stick to those kind of economy sensitive cyclical sectors of the market for now. Now, within cyclicals, that's admittedly a pretty broad bucket. So generally includes things like consumer discretionary, industrials, materials, energy, technology, and financial stocks. And now real estate, because they split the sector, right? So what do you do? Do you choose the kind of value-oriented financial sectors, or do you go with the growthier technology ones. So again, my view is in order to have a clue as to where we might be heading, I think we have to know first where we are and how it sits relative to the past. We have to know our history, right? And I think this too is instructive on that score. So again, looking at technology and financial sector returns in the very same tightening cycles, Again, a similar message kind of comes out and reinforces the conclusions that we're driving towards here. More often than not, and I'm a contrarian by nature, it might not feel good, but that's actually the right way to invest. The technology sector outperformed the financial sector, again, by almost 70% of the time. And you can see the average returns on the far right-hand side. So technically, What's the setup? Heading into this year, I'm just gonna say, financials and energy stocks are tactically overbought. I would use those as 
a source of funds. All right? So start thinking about locking in your gains. Reap the rewards. While technology stocks, which have been bearing the brunt of the sell-off, are now extremely technically oversold. We like that as contrarian investors. And as long as we're in this kind of technical or tactical slowdown regime, we think that that once again will make technology stocks more interesting to investors going forward. That wraps up the bulk of the presentation. And maybe I'll, I'll put a bow on it by saying, look, where have we come from? A lot has happened in a very short period of time. It has been almost a textbook cycle. Everything that you would expect to happen based on history has, with the exception that this has been an exceptionally short business cycle or market cycle. Right? It's all been compressed into a shorter time frame. So if we remember back to the, the dark days of early 2020, that was actually the shortest economic recession on record. It was only two or three months. If you blinked, you missed it, literally. Okay? That was then followed by the initial recovery stage of the cycle, new cycle. Great year for risk assets, including corporate credit and stocks. Those were the leaders, right? Corporate bonds and I would say government bonds even more so were at the bottom of the leaderboard. Okay? And that took us to the expansion phase where we, we made back everything that we lost and then some. We've actually eclipsed the pre-pandemic levels of activity. This is very welcome news. Now we're on the other side of it. As I've been saying, the Fed is tightening policy at the margin into slowing growth or more moderate pace of growth. So that's where we are right now. And history shows if we stick to that blueprint, this is also the time where stocks will continue to do well. And within equity markets, if past this prologue, we should be favoring the domestic large cap growth stocks, particularly technology. That's it for me. We hope you enjoyed the show. My name is Kevin Swanson. I'm the CEO of Potentia Wealth. Today I'm going to be talking with Brad Fisher. Brad is a new uh, financial advisor that we've hired down in Southern California. We've had an opportunity to have a discussion with him for the first time as part of the Potentia team. Welcome. Thank you, Kevin. We also uh, run through the conversation that we just had with Tally Leger from Invesco. Uh, very interesting, his seven points or seven reasons to be investing in equities right now in a, in a rising interest rate environment. What were some of your takeaways from that conversation? Well, probably the bottom line is I, I, uh, I left feeling a whole lot better, you know, with all of the horrible things we're hearing on the news about interest rates going up and inflation going up. And uh, it's kind of a, a very scary time for a lot of investors. And I was pretty pleased to see that as he talks about some of these equities, statistically or, or historically, should continue to, uh, to increase. Maybe not at the same rate that we've seen the last few, uh, few years, but it sounds like it's pretty positive. It's, it's all the uncertainty that causes the volatility in the market uh, and the volatility that creates more uncertainty. So we're getting a lot of calls from clients right now about the uh, like decreases in the market, the, uh, the a couple hundred points up and down that we see on a daily basis. Uh, and all of this uh, is with, with the uncertainty of interest rates and what they are going to, what impact they're going to have. And so his information showed us that uh, every single time that we've had interest rate increases, we've had positive markets. And, and that's because we're, we're dealing with uh, inflation. Inflation means that our economy is heating up. Mm. And as it's heating up, our companies are doing well and people are spending money. Otherwise, we wouldn't have that, that hot economy. So the Fed is increasing interest rates to help cool that down and to, to bring it more into alignment. They're looking for a 2% you know, inflation target. We've got a ways to go from the seven we're experiencing right now. Uh, but you know, that's, that uncertainty is creating the volatility right now. And I think that 
That'll go away as we get further into the year and start to see the Fed doing what we expect the Fed to do. We've heard about a lot of, uh, the Fed is talking about having multiple increases over the next, uh, the next 12 months or so. Is that something we should be concerned about? You know, <clears throat> we, we put a lot of faith in the Fed and they, they have some very difficult decisions to make. This is a, a unique situation. It's not like we've had a pandemic in the last hundred years. And uh, we've gone through one of the fastest recessions or, or quickest recessions in history. And we've recovered very quickly from that. And we, we talk about a compressed market cycle. It's very compressed and it's moving very quickly. Uh, inflation is a problem and uh, interest rates should be raised in order to get it under control. But with, with the uh, inflation we're seeing, there's a piece that can be controlled by the Fed and there's a piece that can't be controlled. And the piece that can't be controlled is what we're experiencing uh, the greatest part of right now caused by the supply chain dysfunction. And, so, and the supply chain is, is starting to resolve itself. Well, we've seen that already. Uh, we've, the numbers statistically show that our supply chain is, is healing itself. And so that process has started and we expect that, that uh, within the next few months we'll start to see some real numbers and start to feel the impact of the supply chain loosening again. That's going to solve the, the part of the inflation that the Fed can't fix. But we, we do have inflation uh, that the Fed can fix. And so I think that uh, an interest rate increase in March, the end of March, which is probably likely, and whether that's a, a quarter or half a percent, that should get us started. And then there, you, we may see one or two more increases and then a hawkish pause. That, a hawkish pause. Yeah, that, 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 that time when the Fed says, all right, now we've increased interest rates, let's take a breath and, and see what's going to happen. You know, in, in history, the Fed has raised interest rates very quickly, small chunks typically at a time, uh, every six weeks or so. And, and that has uh, a rippling effect. So it's like throwing a pebble into a lake and you get a ripple from that. But before it reaches the edge, so you can see what the effect is, they start throwing in more pebbles. So I think that in order to thread this, this inflation problem they have, they need to start with a, a, a half a percent or a couple of quarter percents and then wait. So I think that when the market is forecasting four or five interest rate increases, uh, that may happen. I just don't think it's going to happen immediately. I think that we'll probably see a couple of interest rate increases, wait for the effect, and then maybe some more interest rate increases if necessary after that, particularly after we've had time for the supply chain to heal itself and, 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 and getting rid of that inflation component. So just a bump, see what happens, dial, the, dial it up a little bit, see what happens. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Uh, when the Fed raises interest rates, it is not an immediate impact. It takes, it takes time for that to resonate out through the rest of the economy. And so I think that whether that's w one bump at a half a percent or a couple of quarter percents or maybe a half a percent and a quarter percent, but then you need to wait to see what the impact of that is going to be, particularly when we're already starting to see that piece of the inflation that the Fed can't control, which is the broken supply chain healing itself and things starting to come back into alignment again. And everything we're seeing right now is suggesting that the supply, supply chain is healing itself. It's already the numbers show that that's happening. We just haven't felt it yet. We're, we're still paying way too much for groceries. Gas prices are still increasing. The things that, that impact us on a daily basis, uh, they're there. But if we look at the numbers of, uh, the numbers of ships that are actually making deliveries, if we look at the, uh, the backlog of, of uh, orders is shrinking, all, all of those things, uh, the numbers are getting better. We just haven't felt it yet. 
how long do you think it's going to take before we start filling that, filling that on in, in my grocery cart when when I go to the grocery store? Yeah. So that's a conversation I had with Tally after he got done with his presentation, and he said based on his projections, we should start to to feel that in a uh, April May time frame. April May, that's really right around the corner. Yeah. The good news is, as you started off with. Uh, all of this uncertainty that we're experiencing now uh, is, is created by things that are getting better. The supply chain is healing itself. Mm -hmm. uh, it looks like the, the uh, geopolitical issues we have with Russia and the Ukraine seem to be uh, mitigating uh, at this moment. Uh, and, and the inflation that we have concerns about caused by the supply chain should resolve much of itself beginning with that in a April, May time frame and, and then moving forward over the next year or so. Uh, and then with the Fed raising interest rates, after that hawkish pause that I believe they're gonna take, we may need to lower interest rates again to make sure that we keep things on the level. It'll be very interesting to see how they manage this complicated process and they thread this needle uh, over the next year. The good thing is Chairman Powell, I believe has the ability to do that, and he's got a really good team around him in the Fed. Uh, so I think that we will manage through this process just fine. You, you touched on the geopolitical situation. Do you see any impact that we're going to see? Let's just say things wind up heating up more in, uh, in Ukraine, um, or for that matter, elsewhere on the globe. Do you see that having much of an impact? It depends on where on the globe. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that the impact of Russia and the Ukraine has a lot less impact on us than, say, does China and Taiwan. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, Taiwan is responsible for more than 70% of the intelligent chips that are created for the world. And those are the things that are going into our phones and our cars and our... Uh, and and if, if China, you know, walks into Taiwan or we end up with a conflict there, I think there's a much more significant impact. We don't do much trading with the Ukraine. Uh, we know that that has an impact on Ukraine. Uh, that has an impact on on the political uh, perspective on a global scale. Uh, but from an economic scale, by the time those ripples get to the United States, it's it's just that that not that much of an impact. Very good. I'm out of questions, <laughs> <laughs> which is a good thing. It means that we we are heading into what we expect to be a rising interest rate environment. Uh, markets do well in those times. And the things that we have the most concerns about today, and it's creating all those uncertainty, I think will be melting away as we head into the second half of this year. So the big takeaway is I, I shouldn't be concerned, and, and our clients shouldn't be concerned that things will wind up uh, and should continue to improve in the, in the coming months. Shouldn't. But it's always important to constantly watch and be prepared. Things change in this world so fast, and that's one of the reasons that we have a, an investment team that's watching our clients' portfolios every minute the market is open. So while you and I are having a discussion here, or our clients are watching us uh, at home, uh, their portfolios are being managed, and we're watching for things to change. So while we prepare for should, uh, we can also uh, make sure that we're watching out for coulds. I want to thank you again for, uh, for joining our team. I look forward to seeing where Potentia goes with you playing a role in our Southern California territory. Kevin, it's been my pleasure. I'm looking forward to things to come. 